as you uh, may know, there are seven candidates and there are two seats. The proceedings are being recorded and that's for the uh, States of Jersey site, Boat JE, uh, and this is uh, normal for all the hustings now. Uh, the candidates will speak initially uh, for up to four minutes, and we have timekeeping on that, and there's 30 seconds to go. Uh, the bell will ring, and after four minutes, uh, it will ring a couple of times, uh, and that's it, that's uh, time out. The questions will be taken, and it will be appreciated if anybody asking a question could give their name, and the priority will be for the electors of this district first, and we'll go around and hopefully anybody that wants to will be able to ask a question, uh, and if time permits, second questions, and then uh, other people from the parish or wherever uh, may ask a question after that. The aim at the moment is to finish uh, 9.15, 9.30, depending on, on you good people, uh, and it's your meeting uh, with the candidates, so uh, that will be decided uh, on, on the number of questions and uh, how that uh, progresses. The candidates have, uh, lots have been drawn, kind of by uh, Mrs. Keno, and they will speak uh, as in the order that they sit, and uh, Jane Blakely will uh, start the proceedings. Thank you. For the sake of the microphones, can you all hear me? Yes. Could you hear me better then? Yes. Then I'll sit down. <laughs> Good evening, family, friends, and supporters. My name is Jane Blakely. I've been a resident of St. Brillard District No. 2 for 20 years, living and working in this district both as a family and a professional, as a professional person. I'm therefore familiar with the district and many of its residents. I'm qualified as an architect, which is a semi-political role. I've acted on professional and local pressure groups, focusing on protection of the environment, confirming my commitment to political life and its betterment. I feel this goes some way to prepare me for political life and the cut and thrust this may entail. My hopes are to form a strong collaboration with you, the district's parishioners. After all, you are a vital lifeline in the ultimate decision-making process. My policies. Our island is at a critical time in its history, with its industries and if our island is to continue to have prosperity at not too high a cost. As we grow, the impact on the infrastructure is enormous on our roads alone. Further impact on our schools, housing, utility uses, hospitals, food supply and the peace and tranquility of the island. Immigration needs a radical set of policies that looks at the long term and not the short term. We cannot overlook the potential threat to our quality of life. Our recent island budget gave clear indication of a loss with a budget deficit of 30 million. Are we now not, ice, not skating on ice economically? Diversification of industry. We need, as is quite clear, to increase our income and balance our accounts. We must look carefully at the future future of our existing industries and newer industries and plan ahead. Farming must find a new chapter. In turn, we then feed our local economy and not the international markets. Tourism, local arts and culture can serve as a new tourism industry with a gathering number of festivals each year. Our future generally. Our children need to have a choice of career opportunities. What does the future hold for graduates and, not, and those that don't get away to university? We need to control the island's costs, both commercial island rents and general costs are stifling even large businesses, let alone small businesses. Development, my favourite subject. Fast forward now to 2014. The above on rain march the island's demands, the decision to increase immigration, the knock on is development into our green countrysides. We need to cut immigration to the chase and look at our existing housing stock. How can we maximise what we already have? You, the electorate, it's become all too noticeable your complete dissatisfaction with the way the island is being run and you feel you're not being listened to. Why the low voter turnout of 30% versus the recent Scottish elections of 86%? I want to understand why there is such a disconnect. To finish, several quotes. Firstly, the 20th century American pastor, Harry Emerson Fosdyke, once said, 
Democracy is based upon the conviction that there are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. Alternatively, from Elvis Presley of the rock world, truth is like the sun. You can shut it out for a time, but it ain't going to go away. I hope the above gives a flavour of my policies that considers you, the community, and our unique island culture and environment. Vote for me and you vote for long-term objectives, strengthening our community for sustainable island policy. I would be delighted to progress with these policies. For this one small price, you'll vote on October the 15th. Thank you. Good evening, Central Life Spirationists. My name is Beatrice Porre. I came to Jersey over 25 years ago in search of work opportunities. I've worked in the tourism, catering, and farming industries for the first few years. I also worked in the finance industry until deciding to follow my heart and my natural vocation to help and support others. I became an occupational therapist assistant for the mental health service, which I thoroughly enjoyed. By the time I gave birth to my third child, I came to the decision that it was better to stop working because the childcare uh, child costs were too high. Presently, I'm a support worker for vulnerable adults and children. It gives me great satisfaction to support and empower vulnerable people who desperately want to lead independent lives and become fully participants in Jersey society. My politics are about who I am. I am a member of Jersey society with Portuguese background and English as my second language. I am a full-time working mother and also a wife. I feel that Jersey needs to have a, a balanced representation in the state's assembly to reflect the multicultural society that it has become. The state needs to welcome representatives of minority groups to better understand and support those who make a significant percentage of the population. Reform Jersey and I are committed to work towards reducing inequality. The center theme of my manifest is about creating a fairer society in which the vulnerable are looked after and where our public services are funded by a fair tax system that doesn't penalize those on low incomes or the squeezed middle. If elected, I would like to take part in the health and social security scrutiny panel. These are both areas that are facing serious challenges and I believe that my previous involvement with mental health and my present role as a support worker are both will both provide me with the relevant experience to support those vulnerable groups in Jersey society. I will support moves to take GST of food and utility bills and will vote to raise to never raise, will never vote to raise GST above 5%. I will support a crackdown on abusive zero hour contracts and support the introduction of a living wage, which must be, must be present, uh, which must be higher than the present minimum wage and as much as possible enough for someone to live off without having to claim income support. As a parent of children at Canterbury School, I'm only too aware how many residents feel anxious about the rebuild or possible relocation of the school. Canterbury is a fantastic school and I feel many parents appreciate the hard work that both the past and present heads, along with their staff, have put into making sure that the school, which has doubled up in students' numbers, still functions to its best ability. But it is vital that our young people are able to be educated in a school with the best facility and learning environment. So we need deputies who will work with the community to make sure that the new school is fit for purpose and takes into account the quality of life of those living near it. If elected, I can be relied upon to vote in the interest of ordinary Jersey people. Finally, I'm standing as a candidate for Reform Jersey, along with Montfort, because we need to work together as a team to achieve more, rather than everyone pulling in different directions. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. Good evening, Mr. Speaker. Good evening, everyone. I am Peter Troy, and I have previously served as a deputy in St. Brellard for nine years uh, and stepped down in 2008 for family reasons. I have a great deal of experience in politics in both parish and island issues. I have long campaigned for transparency in government and have also brought many successful propositions to the states. When deputy, I was always keen to work with the Connetard, fellow deputies and parish officials, as I believe as working part of a team uh, that ensures successful and effective results for our parish. Over the years, when contacted by parishioners, I have always tried to help them with their problems, often with successful outcomes. Uh, for example, I was contacted by several parishioners with regard to access problems along Route to Kenway. In consultation with Transport and Technical Services, I instigated disabled friendly pavements from Red Houses to St Peter's Garden Centre. As chairman of the St Brellard's Youth Club Management Committee some years ago, I helped steer the club through a very difficult period financially, when it was threatened with closure uh, due to lack of funds. At that time, I worked with the parish to secure funding, which ensured that the youth club was able to continue. And it is now financially stable and plays a very important part in parish life. Le Canabay School is outdated uh, and is so overcrowded that we now need to look at building a new purpose-built school on a new site. And I would support this, but subject to a full public consultation process particularly in regard to pedestrian, uh, cycle and vehicle access. This would free up the old school site for sheltered housing for the elderly, community buildings and perhaps even open space. With regard to island issues, we all know that the economy is under pressure and there will probably be calls to raise GST. I am against increasing the rate of GST and instead would advocate real cuts in public spending uh, making sure that essential services are maintained and that taxpayers' money is not wasted. I feel strongly that we need to step up efforts to stimulate all areas of the economy. We have a small business loan scheme which is inadequately funded uh, and this requires uh, additional resources. Supporting the creation of new small businesses can help stimulate and diversify our economy. I also want to ensure that uh, elderly care and disability care are prioritised for additional support, as we must look after the most vulnerable in our society. Nobody in retirement should have to choose between eating or eating, and I do not support the provision of hospital facilities over two sites. It will be a costly and logistical nightmare to both operate and administer. In this financial climate, Young people are concerned about employment opportunities. We have to ensure that adequate resources are given to teachers to enable them to uh, provide the necessary skills for pupils to gain employment and achieve their goals. Here is my manifesto. Everyone here this evening has a copy. Please, uh, please take time to look at it and compare it with those presented by the other candidates. My manifesto can also be viewed at www.petertroyjersey.com. I was born and live in St. Brallard, and I care very much about our community. I believe that I have an excellent track record in politics, and hope that you will support me by voting Peter Troy for experienced, effective, and sensible politics on the 15th of October. Thank you. Thank you. The next candidate is Jeff Hathaway. I'll stand so that hopefully you can all hear me because uh, we're able to share. No. Yeah. No. You can't hear me. No. Turn now. Okay. Sure. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen and fellow parishioners. Why am I standing for deputy? I've stood before and looking back at my past election leaflets, I'm dismayed that despite the intervening years, many issues of concern I had then once again feature in this election. Population, taxation, 
state spending and waste of public money, lack of government support for tourism, inappropriate development, diversifying our economy, the challenges faced to our young people with opportunities and jobs, education, and yes, the Canterbury School. I could go on. But I've not been idle in that time, as you can see from my leaflet. The parish newsletter, coordinating the Bloom Group, spearheading the introduction of public allotments, not just here in St. Brellard, but now in St. Helia and St. John, sitting on three states' working groups and continuing in my role of centenaire and more. As a centenaire, I am charged by the court to keep young people out of the criminal justice system wherever possible and I've been active in supporting a wide range of initiatives to reduce antisocial behaviour and youth crime. This is down almost 70% in St. Bernard and 60% island-wide. On wider issues, I'm concerned with states' fudges, like the current controls on population. They do not take into account the grey economy it clearly generates. There is nowhere near enough, it's nowhere near robust enough. In the honorary police we see this, evidenced by the large number of foreign registered vehicles that remain in the island, yet their owners cannot be located nor sometimes even identified. Reform. Reform of our electoral system is not the exclusive territory of the party that has adopted that name. I term a reformer and there is much work to be done. I will personally be voting yes to keep the constables in the referendum, but whatever the outcome, it must be binding and not another fudge. This district needs a deputy with proven commitment, one who has already made improvements, not just in Sabrella, but around the island, one that has been continually active in the community for many years. The promise I, promises I can make to you are that I will work with the same diligence I've already demonstrated in my parish work and dedicate my time to continuing to serve the people of St. Brellard and in the island as a States Member should I be elected. I'm always accessible, hardworking and caring. I can take the lead when faced with a challenge as I have proved, but I'm also not afraid to take difficult decisions. If you agree with the principles and issues highlighted as needing urgent attention here and in my manifesto, then I would be delighted to receive your vote. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Uh, candidate is Graham Truscott. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Truscott. I'm age 55. I was educated at Lemoyne, the Canabate, and Holy Schools. Four generations of my family have lived in St. Bernard No. 2. I grew up in the parish and spent 36 years of my life in this district, and I feel a real deep affinity towards it. I'm standing as an independent candidate, a successful businessman. I've run my own computer business for the last 24 years, and the company is now being run by my son. Therefore, I'm able to devote 100% of my working time to the role as your deputy. Our parish, God's Parish, is unique, and as your deputy, I would do everything to ensure that it stays that way. I would defend St. Brellard's Bay, our rural and coastal areas, from inappropriate development. I pledge that I would be a dedicated deputy, ready and able to devote my skills helping parishioners solve their problems, however big or small. Since nomination night, I've been out canvassing, and it's been a great pleasure to meet many of you personally. Sadly, the words disappointment and contentment have been expressed by some with regard to our government's performance. Many of you feel let down and are no longer interested in voting. As a candidate, I can sympathise. I too am disenchanted and annoyed by the wasteful spending and squandering of taxpayers' revenue. Your money, my money. Middle income, Jer Middle income Jersey has been squeezed quite enough to pay for failing government policy. <clears throat> now they're taking 90 million. Now they're talking about taking a 90 million pound deficit uh, appearing in our finances within three years. Things feel out of control. I want government government to spend less, cut <coughs> wasting, and make a real effort to maximise efficiency. We need to balance the books. Yes, we need to stimulate the economy. Yes, keep people in work. But let's not blow our financial security in the process. Immigration has also been a hot topic. 
Most people seem to approve of my suggested policy. Cap the population, introduce time and job specific work permits, and as far as I'm concerned, that would be the job done. So if you want another 100 workers for whatever project, issue them with a work permit, apply PAYE tax to their pay, and at the end of the contract they leave the island and everyone's happy. The all-important economy is where I believe as a businessman I can contribute the most. We need to diversify and become less reliant on our finance industry. Essentially, we need to bolster the other strings of our economic bow. I would love to be involved in reviving tourism and developing the new digital economy. Let's get behind our, new, uh, our, our young farmers and start exporting more genuine Jersey products. Without a successful economy, we are lost. We need the jobs, we need the revenue from businesses to support public services. If these fail, taxes will keep rising and living standards will fall. There is only so much I can say in four minutes, so please read my manifesto. It covers my views on health, education, government, government reform and taxes. Uh, incidentally, it's uh, printed on recycled paper because I care for the environment. Everything is in mono to keep the cost down, hopefully proving to you that you don't need to spend a fortune on colourful, glossy manifestos and roadside posters to get elected. For me, it's about my policies, my passion for my parish and the island, and putting you, the people, first. I stand before you a genuine Sir Rollard old boy wanting to become your voice, your champion in government. Empower me and energise me with your vote, and I promise to work tirelessly on your behalf to get things done. It would be an honour and a privilege of a lifetime to serve my parish. Please consider giving me one of your two votes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I will stand up because I'd like to see who I'm talking to. Uh, I'd like to see the whites of their eyes like they do in the States. Um, and hopefully you uh, can see me too. Um, it's good to see so many of you here tonight. It shows that democracy is alive and well in the parish of St. Bullard in the, in the district number two of our parish. And it's good to see the other candidates here as well contesting and fighting for democracy, which is unfortunately not necessarily so vibrant in other parts of our island. It's been my privilege to serve this district for the last two uh, terms, it's the last six years. Um, during the last term, I believe that I've remained true to my manifesto pledges, two of which were, were one, to look at the access to justice in Jersey. That's something which I've been managed to uh, bring through with working collaboratively with the Chief Minister's Department and other states' members, something which may even come up this evening, who knows. Um, and the other issue is really about housing, both affordability of housing and also for those who are condemned to renting, like many of the younger generation, because they cannot afford uh, the uh, very high housing prices and cannot necessarily expect even the minimum standard. That is now on the table with successful propositions brought to the states. I believe that during the last six years I've shown myself to be an effective constituency representative as well as a capable and articulate states member and one who is able to ask the tough questions of ministers, hold them to account where necessary but at the same time work collaboratively with ministers, colleagues and the departments. Some of those areas that I have been able to work with on top of housing and the access to justice review which is actually going on at the moment, incidentally any of you who had any experience, good or bad, can feed into that. Um, I've also been working with the education department. The reviews just came out about modern languages and I'm very keen to push that through so that young people are learning modern languages at a younger age so that they can be fluent, not simply by the time they qualify from university but at a very young age. And also, more recently, uh, curbside recycling to progress that. We live in a very small island, there's no reason in this day and age that we shouldn't have curbside recycling for everybody in the island, no matter where one lives and that's something I hope would happen sooner rather than later. Um, I want to focus on three key areas in the uh, next term if I'm <coughs> fortunate enough to be re-elected. Those are health, education and also social security reforms. With education I think we've been somewhat let down during the last six years. Firstly because I believe that the minister before the current one was not allowed to do what he wanted to do wasn't given the ministerial support by his colleagues, but similarly, 
the last outgoing uh, education minister waited until the very end to say that things were not as they should be in the education department, meaning that for three years uh, he wasn't really trying to rectify those areas. Education is a hot potato and it reflects the fact that we live in a divided island where the gap between the haves and the have-nots, the socio-economic divide, is actually increasing and that is also manifested in our education system which is increasingly selective, increasingly elite. It's not something that can be tackled easily because it's politically suicide for perhaps to take on the, the lobby, but it is something that needs to be addressed if we're not to fail children that are coming out of the education system. I'm keen to look at healthcare. I think it's absolutely a disgrace that in Jersey many people cannot afford to go and see a GP. There's a disincentive for many and that has a knock-on effect in the future. I'll sum up pretty quickly. Um, those are areas mental health, respite, which we won't hear about again tonight. Tax and spending is key. I will oppose any increase in GST. I brought a proposition to the states to try and get GST removed from fuel, domestic fuel, because uh, it's expensive enough. That was rejected, but I hopefully with more fellow travellers in the states, we can get things like that through. I will be keen to work in education, and I'll leave uh, the rest of the time for the other candidates. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And the uh, final candidate is Natalie Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm also going to stand. I'm a little bit more comfortable doing that just for now. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As a new candidate, I feel it is important that I introduce myself and tell you a little bit about me and my history. I'm Natalie Duffy. I'm born in Jersey, married to Damon, and have two daughters. I've lived in St. Bernard for much of my life. I studied at Mont Nicole before heading to FCJ and then on to Holia. I have been involved in business since my mid-twenties, running our family business, the Fantastic Tropical Gardens, and Parkins Advertising Distribution Services, and then for the last 16 years, the Salty Dog Bistro in St. Obin. <coughs> like me, the electorate are disappointed and feel let down by the current political status, and our referendum vote being ignored simply added insult to injury. The reason I'm standing for Deputy of St. Bernard is that I want to do something about it. I wish to apply my skills and experience and make a contribution over and above my current commitments with the aim of creating opportunities and brighter prospects. I'm prepared to take on the challenge because I believe that now is the time to make it happen. I have optimism and passion for Jersey and I endorse the preservation of our environment, our heritage, culture and courteous traditional values. I'm old enough to have a healthy collection of life experiences to draw on as a source of knowledge when needing to make considered <coughs> difficult decisions. I have the business acumen and intelligence to work efficiently and in tune with life in 2014. And I'm young enough and I'm fired up enough to have the energy to meet the demands of the challenges that lie ahead. My manifesto states my primary focus will be on tourism, small business and the development of Le Kenneve School. However, if I'm elected as deputy, I have a responsibility directly to the people of St. Bernard and I have a clear agenda of what I would like to do and how I would like to achieve this, which, is I, which I hope we will cover in the Q&A. Regarding our tourism industry, right now, it's at a crucial turning point, and I hope to be able to inject a can-do approach in the drive to push our potentially brilliant tourism industry back to where it should be. I'm tired of negative publicity, and I wish to change the attitudes of those who control the budgets and policies to consider a more positive approach to tourism that will inspire innovation and nurture confidence. The tide of change has already been reflected in the recently published GBA figures, albeit small. We have so much to offer, so much to take advantage of. All we need is the commitment and the dedication, and we will make progress. 
Anyone who knows me will confirm I come from a family who work hard and we go the extra mile. And that is what I intend to do if I'm elected as deputy. The electorate of St Brellard, I like many other parishes, have a great number of candidates to consider, which I think is a very positive re reflection of St Brellard, engaging with the future of parish and island politics. I would urge you to think carefully and base your decision on who you think best represents you, what you wish for the future of your parish and for the future of Jersey. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's we do have some uh, roving microphones, so I would ask anybody who wants to ask a question to wait till we get uh, the microphone. As I said at the start, the priority will be from the electors of this district, so if you could also state that uh, at the outset and your name. And what we're going to do, we're going to change the order uh, for the questions, so the, uh, uh, Natalie Duffy will answer the uh, the first question first and then we'll move along uh, and then depending on time we'll keep doing that uh, until we get a better. So now it's, um, it's up to you if anybody would like to ask a question, uh, please, please raise your hand lady. Yeah. Thank Hi, I'm uh, Leslie Bratch and I'm from District Number 2. Um, just want to say good evening to you all first. Uh, before I ask my question, I'd just like to take a minute, if you don't mind, to introduce myself properly. I'm firstly a parent and a carer of my daughter, who will be 20 in January. She has profound mobility and learning difficulties, along with severe medical issues. I'm also, in my spare time, chair of SNAP, which stands for Special Needs Advisory Panel, working on behalf of people with learning disabilities and or autism, with their families and carers. As a resident of this parish, I would like to think that our elected deputies will represent all the parishioners and support their issues within the state system. There are a number of families within this parish who have children and young people with a high level of complex needs. As you will probably be aware, Oakwell respite home for children has recently received a complete makeover costing £840,000. This is obviously very good news and desperately needed. However, my understanding is that not all the rooms are being used and the whole facility appears to be closing at certain times during the week. Bearing in mind that once our children reach the age of 18, they have to move on from Oakwell and there being no other bespoke adult respite provision, how would you as a deputy, try to put right this disparity between the services while endeavouring to make sure that Oakwell is used to its optimum. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, and it's Natalie Duffy to answer first. Leslie, thank you very much for your, your question. Um, I will be completely honest with you, it isn't an area that I'm extremely familiar with, but I would like to answer you um, from the heart and from my experience as a mother. Um, obviously there is um, some discrepancy in the operations that you've just described. That is something that really should be addressed quite swiftly. There, isn't so, it, 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 there are areas in, in the management of certain um, businesses and this particular, in this particular situation at Oakwell that if the service isn't working properly, then it needs to be addressed, get down to the bottom of it and resolve it. A lot of money has been invested in it, the will is there, so why is it not working properly? Um, I would thank you for drawing it to the attention of the panel, and um, I hope that from this meeting, something will be done. And we don't need a new politician, we don't need a new deputy for that to happen. So that's my answer. Thank you. Um, thank you, Leslie. Um, it, it's a shame because I know that you've been fighting for this really good at the last um, casting. You probably asked a similar question, and, and the one I know you've been working hard. I think that there's a key issue, first of all, to take it back one step. The states need to implement the disability discrimination law. That, that element, that's been a long time coming and it's still not being given the correct priority. We need a disability strategy, Guernsey 
have done great work in that area and they're ahead of the game. So I, and I think your organisation, SNAP, is, is to be commended for that because you're putting the pressure on that. The, the paradox is we already have some very good champions for disability in the States, but I think they're being ha hamstrung partly due to a lack of political will, but also probably due to financial resources not being made available. And it's, it's always the case that whether it's disability, in this case perhaps physical, but in other areas mental health, is always are always the poor relations. And I think the States needs to give that more priority by doing that whole list of things. And also, we can't do that by cutting um, spending. This is one area of spending that needs to be increased, not reduced. And I'll certainly, hopefully, we'll get more States members in the future who are on board with that. Hi, Leslie. Uh, we've actually met, haven't we, on, when I was, uh, and we are virtually neighbours, you live just a few doors down from me, so I'm, I am aware of your uh, situation. Is it the situation, because they've stopped uh, fully funding the, the Oakwell Centre, is it the, the shortage of money, or what's happened there? The situation is more that we appreciate the money that's been put into the children's service. Right. But as, as adults, you have the children growing out of Oak Farm. Where do they then go? We have no respite at the moment. Right. So respite needs to be provided. Yes, for the adult service, there's a disparity between the children's service. Are you dealing with anybody in the States at the moment uh, with regard to this? Or? Yeah, we have ongoing discussions. Right. But, but we can go to meetings after meetings. And get nowhere. It just the, round in circles. It, it, it's a complete waste of time. Exhausting. I did, uh, did promise you, should I be elected, that I will happily uh, get involved with trying to sort that out for you. Um, I, I was appalled the other day that uh, I think people being ferried backwards and forwards uh, with disabilities to various respite places the, uh, the service had been cut. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, and as I say, should I be elected, I'll, I'll come and talk to you and see if we can get something sorted out. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, congratulations for... Uh, you can't hear me. Sorry, congratulate you for uh, um, actually forming SNAP. Um, this is an affluent island and it worries me that uh, so many people have to spend a lot of time bringing this to the attention of politicians and rely often on charities to fund them, to help them out. Um, whilst I was doorstepping, I also spoke with a lady, I think Morfin uh, knows her, who has got a daughter with cystic fibrosis. And she is also suffering from the same problem of being able to break down the barriers with the states and to get the help that she needs as a carer. And I think this is part of the, uh, of the issue. And uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not right that we should be sitting here, um, and this is not the first time, as I've said before, that we've sat here and discussed these facts, that uh, we don't have the support coming from the states that we should, especially when we're paying people a lot of money to run our health service. But as I, uh, as I said early, this, earlier, this needs uh, additional funds prioritised uh, towards it. So both the elderly and uh, the disability uh, facilities need funding and they need continuous funding. And there does need to be a plan out into the future. So, so often we see things in Jersey happening too short term. And this is something where you need a long term strategy and people need to be thinking now uh, about this out into the future. Um, uh, I think there are some excellent, uh, there's some excellent charities who do a lot of work as well, and I'd like to, I'd like to um, congratulate them, not just, uh, not just SNAP, but there are other organisations uh, who are helping people in the community who really need help. I mean, I've had some experience with uh, Hillary, uh, uh, someone in my, in my family has needed the help of Headway. And th there are these organisations who do some great things and, and I think they can be uh, involved in helping uh, it out into the future. And they need to be consulted about the facilities and they need to have their input into what, what uh, needs to happen in the future. So that's very important as far as, uh, as I, can, I can see. So we need a long-term strategy, um, uh, charities helping out and, and giving their input and, uh, and, I, and I think also we need additional funding. Thank you. Hi, Leslie. 
Um, very sad, sad to hear about the uh, situation. Uh, to me, I mean, it's all, all very obvious that uh, how important is the anti-discrimination law in Jersey, especially in terms of disability. Uh, and it just goes to show that sometimes the most vulnerable people in our society are left without the support they need. I mean, for what you said uh, about the Hopewell House, uh, the most important issue seems to be staff and costs involved that is stopping uh, uh, families like yourself having the support you need. So therefore, it's very important that you keep raising your uh, your cases and make you aware that uh, it is a, a very genuine situation and we need to address it. And it's not one of those situations where costs should really be cut because it's a priority and vulnerable people need the support. So I hope that whoever becomes the deputy of San Palaz district number two is going to take that as my priority. Thank you. Hi, Leslie. Um, it's, it's a distressing story to, to hear but um, a commendable story that you, you've made the effort to set up SNAP. Um, it would seem that there's, there's a few areas that, that are actually facilitating disabled and um, learning difficulties. That's in, within education, that's within the state schools, um, there is um, quite a lot of support from um, teachers who are trained especially. Um, am I understanding that it's, it's from the age of 18 onwards that, that you have a concern? <coughs> Well, just to, to finish up, um, I wish you luck with it. I would say that um, much has been said here that there seems to be a lack of joined up thinking with it. Um, and um, uh, yes, perhaps with more legislation and more efforts, perhaps um, uh, collaborate with a few other charities um, and whoever is the deputy, the two deputies that get through, we can assist. Thanks. Question. Gentleman at the back, and then, uh, and then I'll go to you next. And uh, one for Teddy who will answer this question first. Thanks. Um, my name is James Rondell. I live at the Moy, and um, I work for a large company. And my job is dependent on the finance industry, as are the jobs of most of my friends and family. It seems to me there's been a concerted effort made by some of our politicians to undermine the validity of the finance industry, despite having little to no alternative to its wealth and job creation. Will the candidates accept a pledge to support and endorse the finance industry? After all, wealth has to be created before it can be redistributed. Thank you. And it's uh, first. <coughs> Thank you, James. Um, wealth does have to be created, but finance doesn't create the wealth. It deals with the wealth that has already been created. That's the difference. Um, and I was waiting for this question to come up, and that's why I'm standing ready to take it. Um, I'm, I've said in my literature I will support a, an ethical uh, finance centre, which I hope we all do. And I, one of the key, um, key manifesto pledges of Reform Jersey and myself is to progress uh, fair taxation. Um, I think that says it all. Of course, we know that Jersey is reliant on finance, but in fact it's over-reliant on finance. And I think it's important that we need to engage not only with the uh, very slick operation that is Jersey Finance, which markets the industry and spins one particular angle, but we also need to listen to the critics of the industry and those who are also perhaps ambivalent. Because if uh, you had a press of a button, we see some or the majority of that industry decline. And we know that Jersey has relied on uh, knitting in the past, it's relied on agriculture, it's relied on tourism. And these kind of industries are fluid. I think it's important that we don't bury our heads in the sand, but that we're realistic. Of course, we support finance, but we, su we support the good business that's sustainable, not the dodgy business that perhaps was more here in the 80s and 90s. <coughs> yeah, I did put in my uh, manifesto, and I, I, 
um, obviously do support. Um, I would robustly defend, promote and support a vitally important and well-regulated service industry. Um, it does account for 42 per cent uh, of our economy uh, and employs an awful lot of people. I've got family and friends uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, um, but even so, I mean, it's dropped 21 places recently in the league of uh, finance centres uh, in the world. So things are tough, um, but we have, as you say, got to promote it. We're in China doing things for the industry and things, so I think uh, so, so may it continue, because uh, without it, I think that we, we would be lost. Obviously, in my uh, speech at the beginning, I did mention that I would like to uh, diversify and be, take a part in diversifying uh, tourism, agriculture, and the digital economy. We have got to grow uh, other parts of our uh, infrastructure, so, um, Thank you very much. Sure. <clears throat> the question was, uh, would we pledge support for the finance industry? And uh, certainly has my support. It is uh, um, a very, very important industry to the island. And I accept all the arguments in regard to diversifying and the fact that we might need to find uh, new economies in the future. But for the time being, Everyone on the island needs to support it because it's what supports the island. It supports all of us. There's so many people now reliant upon the finance industry. Whether that's good or bad is, is not the issue here. It's the fact that uh, we should not be doing anything to damage it whilst we're looking to diversify our economy. <coughs> well, Jersey Finance, of course, is marketing worldwide, and yes. Uh, we do need uh, to maintain our reputation, and that's why we need to adequately monitor all of the uh, organisations in Jersey, ensure that they are acting in a, a fair and honest manner. I mean, in the UK at the moment, we're seeing prominent banks being sued by their clients, and uh, and I think that uh, that hasn't got here yet, uh, but, it, but it, you know, it potentially could it could happen uh, if banks uh, or, or organisations act dishonestly. So sometimes it's down to the organisation that is uh, in a position, giving out its services. They need to act in a responsible manner. Uh, certainly, I support the finance industry. Uh, uh, it, it gives us obviously a great deal of employment. It's important uh, to the to the island. Uh, but as I say, it needs to be uh, regulated properly, it needs to be monitored, and we need to maintain our reputation through providing proper services in the right way uh, to uh, worldwide and locally. Thank you. Hi, James. Um, I have worked in the finance industry uh, uh, previously, and I do understand it's a very important uh, industry we have in Jersey. In fact, it, at a moment like so many have said, it's the main industry in the island that is keeping us all. Um, but I don't want to only support the finance industry. I would like all of us to support all other industries. Maybe the weaker ones need uh, the most support. Small businesses uh, need support as well. And I think we must not be complacent and focus solely on finance industry. But I do, I do agree that it is a very important industry and should be really supported just as like everyone else. OK? okay. Evening, James. Um, my feeling to your question is um, um, finance has been, uh, has created extraordinary prosperity in the island and through perhaps the deepest recession in a hundred years and we for that reason should not in any way knock it and we should encourage it. However, um, as I've said in my uh, opening uh, speech, we cannot overlook also that we have now a budget deficit for the first time um, in decades and we now need to diversify to, to simply have more income. Um, it seems that finance is no longer providing that full income. Perhaps, I'm sure, it's the cost of the island have gone up. Um, so that would be my answer to your question. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through some figures and some information that I have taken note of. Um, Finance industry in Jersey generated £1.5 billion towards our uh, GVA last year. £1 million a day is spent on products and services locally. 
720 million pounds are spent on employment. 310 school leavers were employed in 2013, and 40% of our workforce are in the finance industry. Jersey's not a tax haven, it is a gold star, well-regulated yeah, yeah. international finance centre. <laughs> However, we need to continue to evolve. There are very few of the organisations still now participating in what is called aggressive tax avoidance which is while it's not illegal, it does have some moral considerations and attracts ne negative publicity. The finance industry must be supported once again and go back to its roots to competitive quality service. The recent drop in the standing global index survey does not show, it does show that there is work to be done and for a big part, I suspect that this is because we've become too expensive. It's time to sharpen our pencils. I support the finance industry, and we all should. Thank you. I've seen somebody in there for the next question. Just before I do that, there are a dozen seats or so down the front. If anybody would like to come forward with that, uh, please do. And I've seen somebody in there. Uh, can you put your hand up again, please? <coughs> yeah. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Don Livingstone. I started my teaching career 40 years at Lumley School. I've lived in the parish for 53 years and three children. You know, I haven't heard a single candidate who is directly concerned with the plethora of rules and regulations imposed on nearly every aspect of our lives. In particular, I refer to health and safety, risk assessment, data protection, and aspects of discrimination now. Most people at this meeting, most of you, live quite happily without these impositions in our lives. Without these petty rules which strangle initiative and trust, nobody trusts you anymore. As a head teacher, I was trusted implicitly and left alone. Now, my head teacher colleagues are working with their hands tied behind their backs. We used to live safely and happily without the snowstorm of paper flooding into our lives. How much did all this cost? Can you ask your question? Who was pushing the paper? Who was pushing the paper? I asked the candidates, is all of this necessary? So the, the question is about rules and regulations and general red tape, and it's Graham Trust got two words at first. <coughs> yes, hello, John. Uh, we spoke the other day and uh, did mention a, a couple, quoted a few uh, instances regarding the uh, use to take the children out at um, on activities to uh, Woodworks Valley or wherever it was and uh, with just a couple of you with, with no supervision or anything uh, and you went down had a wonderful time and came back but now it seems that you can't but obviously rules and regulations are created for a reason um, obviously safety is, uh, is an issue um, child protection is an issue and all these things are actually produced to really um, protect uh, our vulnerable and young in society. So all these rules and regulations have a reason and um, you know at the end of the day uh, they should be uh, beyond. Um, yeah you've got, uh, well, I just I can't really think anything else on that one to be honest with you. I think they're there for a reason basically John um, and we have got to uh, protect the vulnerable in society. I think uh, John has actually raised a very important question and it's not simply just about the rules and regulations, it's the way that they're enforced I think is what is wrong. It's quite obvious that we do need certain protection for all sorts of things, <coughs> health and safety is 
largely a matter of common sense, but someone needed to put that into a document and a thick document of that so we can all read and uh, apply the, the, the rules as, as we saw them. But they enforce them to the point where it does impinge upon our lives. And I, for one, and I put it in my manifesto, red tape and bureaucracy are one of the issues that I think needs tackling in the next assembly. There's far too much, not just for business, but for the average person. Um, even for this election, we have to uh, pay £50 to data protection just to get an electoral register. I mean, that is just absolutely crazy. Um, if you're standing for an election and uh, they know you're a candidate, that should be uh, supplied as a matter of course. Well, actually, uh, in many ways, I agree with you. I've seen uh, some forms that you have to fill in, they're two pages, others that are four pages, six pages, eight pages, ten pages, and sometimes you think, why doesn't someone get their plain English book out and just reduce this form, <coughs> cut it in half, uh, so that we can actually get through it? Because I, I think sometimes government is so good at making everything so long and so long-winded um, that it becomes uh, a, a uh, a pain uh, in the derriere, as one might say. Um, I think also that um, there does need to be less red tape, particularly in uh, in business and in in some areas of our lives. There just is there is too much there, and uh, the economic development minister, for example, could be looking at cutting some of that red tape that is related to uh, business areas. Certainly, yeah, you mentioned that you were involved in teaching. When I was chairman of the youth club, I did a child protection course. Of course, that's very important uh, uh, in, uh, in that instance. Uh, you, you, must, you must have protection of children in, in all instances there where people are dealing with children. Uh, so that uh, I certainly haven't got a problem with. But give us plain English, get smaller forms, get real with uh, some of the business hoops that we have to go through and some of the hoops in our personal lives. So uh, I, I agree with you in, in many ways. Hi John. Uh, rules, regulations and red ta tape. Yes, uh, it seems that they sometimes um, take away the fun and spontaneity out of uh, actions and acts. Uh, but they do exist for a reason, and I think the fact that we seem to live closer together every day and our lives are more interlinked, we need to be careful how we, uh, we proceed when we take action, especially in, with regards to schools, as you mentioned, as being a teacher. Um, there's really not much we can do at the moment. I think rules and, and regulations are here to stay. Uh, ideally, I mean, they could be more common sense, but uh, they're not always common sense. I wonder whether it all started maybe with insurance companies, law firms. Uh, I don't know, but they are here, and uh, I think they do annoy everyone every now and then anyway. Uh, I don't think I can change that. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening, John. Um, I can sense your frustration, to say the least, at the front of the room here. Um, I would understand that in your position as a head teacher that you will probably have reports if not experienced the extent of um, legislation, health and safety for teachers now, and the amount of paperwork they have to carry out um, has become extensive, um, which makes their, their job um, a, a much longer day. Um, I know that from my own family life and my own daughter. Um, the second point is um, small businesses. Um, if, if I was to be voted in as deputy, this is one area I would like to focus on strongly because my understanding is there is a lot of red tape for small businesses, too much. Um, not only do we have high costs in the island, but red tape that is absolutely squashing anybody wanting to start a small business. Um, the majority of our, of our businesses on the island will be small. So, John, fully commiserate. It's a very good question. Thanks for raising that. Yes, it is a very good question, and it is also something I think that annoys all of us. Um, but unfortunately, it's a fact of life that a lot of these rules and regulations are put in place to protect us, and that really is the bottom line. Um, as a businesswoman, I know full well how much administrative work is involved 
from filling out ITIS forms, GST forms, social security forms, health and safety forms, best practice procedures, regulation of undertakings, it goes on and on and on. Nevertheless, they are there because they need the information to be processed. I would like to see I would like to see it all reduced, but realistically, how much of that can we get rid of? We can work with the states. We can hopefully create a communication system where we can speak to one department once and that gets passed on to the rest of the departments in one go. That would be a good idea. Um, but going back to the question, the reason why we have health and safety regulations, the reason why we have risk assessments is to protect us and it's to make sure that when things happen and they go wrong, they don't go wrong. Okay. okay th thank you, John. It's a great question. It cuts really to the heart of politics. You know, are you, is one a libertarian or does one favour the nanny state? And certainly for my part, um, I think it's all about balance. One example is that, um, you know, I, I didn't support the introduction of the cycle helmets for 14 year olds or younger because I thought it's a silly law, it does, it's not enforceable and even we've heard this week basically the police and the minister saying we're not really going to enforce it anyway, so what's the point in having that? It's just extra legislation which is costly. But when it comes to, for example, smoking in a confined space with a young child, I think that is a correct law if it comes in because that child doesn't have a choice and if it's a choice between having bad parents who do exist unfortunately and that child's safety, then I think it's a, it's a balancing act. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to legislate for the minority, and most people in this room wouldn't go out and commit murder, um, even if there wasn't a law saying that you can't murder, but there, there are who would do that, and that's unfortunate why we have those kinds of laws. So I think it's about balance. And there'll be people in, in this room who complain about over-regulation, but when I step outside, say they want more regulation when it comes to parking in the Kennebay, Don Farm and Bellevue. So, so it is a, it's a balancing act. Uh, next question, please. Lady here, and then I'll come over there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, my name is Karen Burgess. Um, I live in this area of St. Bernard's. Of course, I've been to Trinity, but I've lived here all my married life. I'm sure, like lots of people, we're very distressed about the amount of development that's going on in St. Bernard's, particularly with um, relation to the bay. But that's another story entirely. Um, what I am concerned about is that I have two children, um, and they and their friends have reached a stage in their lives when they aspire to buy a small house of their own so they can start a family and perhaps move up the land later. But as I travel around the island, all I see is the small houses which used to exist and were within the reach of people of my children's age have been purchased either by developers or other people who have made them larger and larger and taken them out of the housing stock for all of our young people. We're going to end up with an island of huge 750,000 pound houses and no small family houses to buy. And I wondered what the uh, panel thought about that. Thank you for your question. The first uh, answer we would have cut the way on the, uh, the issue is affordability of housing, especially for young people and first arrivals. Thank you, Karen. Very good uh, question as well. Um, I am not sure there's an easy answer to this. Um, we are heading for a uh, much larger population than uh, they're telling us, and the pressure on building homes just generally is quite high. Um, and therefore, um, land prices just go up and up and up, and that's part of the equation to uh, uh, what, what or why that uh, building is itself so expensive. Um, but I think there must be um, a proper policy put in place for first-time buyers. At the present time, we've, we've got uh, various uh, schemes that are running um, on, that, uh, on that particular issue, but uh, it doesn't seem to be very coherent. Um, we've got um, anything from you know, flying freeholds where um, old buildings have been converted into flats um, and you buy a flying freehold. You've got uh, um, 
social um, rental um, accommodation as well, which is a form of, uh, of uh, dealing with that. But it's not cohesive, in my view. OK, Karen, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, houses uh, are uh, getting very expensive in Jersey, and it's, uh, it's a problem of... of uh, births are exceeding deaths, uh, so this is something that's always going to be, we're always going to be having uh, an increase in population in that manner. If we're allowing more people into the island as well, that also takes up housing stock, so we, we, uh, we might even need more housing stock in the future uh, if we have a, uh, a more people coming into the island. But certainly for, um, uh, for young people who need to get on the housing, uh, housing ladder, now, um, I, I have got a section in, in here mentioning housing, and I certainly feel that we could come up with an innovate, some innovative schemes whereby the government actually rather, cost the government nothing to actually guarantee uh, young people's uh, uh, funding. If, if young people are in employment, uh, the government could uh, back their mortgage. Uh, that mortgage could come from a bank, and uh, it could be offered at low interest rates, and the government would always have the house as security against that um, uh, guarantee that they've given. So we could actually provide uh, uh, funding for homes uh, with an innovative scheme, but it would need negotiation with the banks and it would need a will from the government to actually commit to having a liability on the balance sheet, but it's always protected by the homes that the people have. So um, that would be my uh, possible solution. But we also need we always need rental units as well because they're they're uh, <laughs> sorry we need rental units as well. <laughs> Hi, Karen. I do agree with you. Yes, housing in Jersey is one of the major issues there is at the moment. Uh, I don't think there is an easy, easy solution. As you said yourself, I mean, some houses are being built in such a, an enormous amount of money that the majority of people can't even consider buying it. I mean, the states have been doing some scheme, schemes where they, you, they can lend you some, an, a certain amount of money and that won't be taxable on or, you know, there is no uh, tax on it. And uh, you have to uh, borrow the rest from the bank. I don't think that is still enough. But then again, we are talking uh, economical situation in Jersey where, you know, construction development is not that it's strong. And we also have to look at the green spaces where the new developments are going to be placed. So that it is a big issue, but it needs to be looked at it very carefully. And ideal, uh, ideally, yes, the young people should, you know, look forward to be able in the future to buy their own properties. But it's not an easy one. Thank you. Evening, Carolyn. Um, yes, you, you've raised a very poignant point. We, we have some of the most expensive um, property prices in the Western world. It's the truth of the matter. Things have gone up dramatically in the last 30 to 40 years. One has to wonder how we got to this situation um, and what are the solutions. Um, I'm not suggesting this is a solution. We did once upon a time, and there'll be people in this room who may recall it, my late father used to discuss it with me, and that was, there was a, cap a, a moderate capping on houses, which actually did give a degree of control of pr um, house prices rising. I'll leave it to yourselves to consider that one. Um, there are schemes which the government is considering. Um, one comes under the umbrella affordable housing, which is encouraging each developer um, to give a percentage of the houses over to lower prices with housing developments. The other is shared equity schemes where um, the government would um, supply a degree of initial funding and loans. Um, I hope this gives some answer to your question um, sure. and that your children do manage to afford up to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, housing, yes. It actually, obviously, as everybody has already said, property prices in Jersey are expensive and it is very difficult <coughs> to get onto the property ladder. And invariably, the bank of mum and dad are called upon to assist with the deposits um, and in fact to assist um, with mortgage at some, at, at some times. Um, it, but it's not a problem that is exclusively one that is of Jersey, it, it's also a UK problem. Um, with regards to the island and the, the um, investment that the States has made recently with regards to social housing, um, uh, £6 million has been invested this year in developing properties on the island and there is additional funds of £65 million over the next five years planned to invest in developing properties um, for people who need to get onto the property ladder and don't have those funds. Thank you. Um, it's an area I'm very interested in and I'd maybe like to talk to you more directly about it. Um, everybody lives somewhere, that might sound like a strange thing to say. Apart from a, an element of casual homelessness, there are people who sleep on friends' sofas, etc. Everybody in Jersey lives somewhere. So it's not simply a case of just building more and more houses for them to live in. It's a question of how do we redistribute the houses that already exist and make them of a better, better quality. Um, the, when something, and this might sound quite radical, but we've got a desperate problem with housing, we need radical solutions. When something is in shortage, one solution is to ration it. Now there are three types, I think, of uh, people who, who live in homes, which we all do. There's those who rent off a landlord, there are those who are homeowners, and there are those who are landlords. And in that last category, there are those who might just have one investment property, that's fine, it's a retirement. There are those who own 50 or 100. And the system is set up to their advantage. We have a social security system whereby people who can't afford their rents, the taxpayer subsidises these multiple landlords' rents. They can buy as many properties as they want and the taxpayer pays for it because we haven't got to grips. That's not a surprise because most of the states is made up of landlords and rentiers with vested interest. We need more states members who are there to represent ordinary people and at the same time population is key. We need to get a grip on population in an honest way, flexible way of course, but not grow the population exponentially like the current administration and council ministers wish to do. Hi Carolyn. Um, yeah, I agree with you about the development of the bay. I did say again in my, I would defend some Burles Bay, our rural and coastal areas for inappropriate development. I think the fact is we're on a, an island 45 miles square and uh, obviously the price of land uh, is prohibitive uh, and the availability of suitable land is also a problem. The states are addressing it and I think as a matter of urgency because we've got a lot of young people wanting to make their lives and their future uh, in Jersey, wanting to settle down and not having the opportunity to buy a house is actually driving them very often away to uh, you know, Australia or Canada or wherever. So I think we, as a matter of urgency, should start providing affordable housing for, the, for our youngsters. Um, the shared equity is, is a possibility. Uh, I know the states have uh, put in place, I think it's 250 million for uh, affordable housing to be rolled out over, over the coming years. So uh, they are aware of the situation. Um, so I think, uh, as you said, we've got to look after our younger generation to make sure they stay in Jersey and feel that they're welcome here as well. Thank you. Uh, I've seen two hands <coughs> here. Show again. Take the pay at the back. Maybe in front of that lady there. <coughs> When, if any of you got in, who you'd like to have as Treasury Minister and who you think would fill our large black hole. Thank you. And it's Peter's I can ask the question. I should declare that I'm not a candidate for Treasury. <laughs> to see Senator Ozef continue as Treasurer. Oh, 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 oh. I, I know that some people are actually here. 
uh, some people here would think that's not a good idea, but he has actually carried out uh, policies in a very sensible manner. I can't think of any states, any states member at the moment, in the existing state shape, I can't think of anyone who could replace him. That's, and, and I've been in that chamber in the past, and I know a lot of the people in there, and I'm telling you there's no one in there that can replace him at this present time. A new candidate, maybe, but Senator Rosef is the man at the moment. And he, he has generally done very well. Okay, so he may have made one or two mistakes somewhere along the line, but you can't be in the state's chamber and get everything right. And I am fully supportive of him uh, for, the, for the Treasury Minister. Absolutely, totally 100% behind him, because he does know what he's doing. You may not like the way he, he can be a little bit abrasive, he can be a little bit uh, uh, strong-headed, but in general terms, when it comes to the Treasury side of the business of running Jersey, he knows what he's doing. And there's no one in that chamber who measures up to him at the moment. Give me a new candidate who is better than him, then yes, I'll vote for them. But at the moment, there's no one there. Hi, uh, sorry I forgot your name. Sharon. Sharon. Um, I do, I, I can feel that you are disappointed. I think m many people are disappointed with the way the budget has been handled uh, lately. I think uh, also maybe he is a, a good uh, minister, but he has made some mistakes and people are, have been left disappointed. Right now, I wouldn't like to be the one to name anybody else as his success, success, successor, but I would like people to have that chance to do it themselves and then they should vote for the, the ones they think they would be a better person. But I really wouldn't like to discuss that at the moment. Sorry. Is it Sharon or Sharon? Sharon. Sharon. No, Sharon. Sharon, sorry. Um, Sharon, and I have to disagree with, with Peter on this. Um, I think the Treasury Minister should be able to balance his books and not willfully add additional taxes as we've been proposed um, to have a property tax in the foreseeable future. Um, this, this would be a disaster for the island. We already have GST that was meant to have stayed at two and a half. We all begrudgingly accepted that. That went up to 5%, and that was under the current Treasury Minister. Um, it strikes me that it's about making the public pay through taxes, um, which is going to carry on happening, if we, if, certainly with the proposal for this latest property tax. Um, we have to have a Treasury Minister who thinks of less spending um, and more saving. Um, first time in decades we've got a budget deficit. We really have to turn that around. We can't afford to keep going like that. So no more taxes, and uh, I think a bit more of a sensible head. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, first of all, we have to see who actually gets elected, in, um, and uh, the odds are pretty tight at the moment as to who actually will be uh, nominated or uh, elected a senator. However, um, I uh, would agree with Peter to a point in that Philip Ozef has had a very tough job to do over the last six years. Running a business, I know how difficult it is to face the challenges of trying to balance the books. I know what it feels like to um, face a winter where your cash flow comes to a standstill and you wonder how you're going to get through the next six months and keep going and keep everybody on the payroll. What Philip Ozef has been doing is obviously on a much grander scale. It's complicated and, and, and in very, very detailed. And his manner and his delivery can sometimes wind you up and get you back up and you don't like the way you're being delivered the information. Ian Gorst has shown us great leadership and a quiet, more gentle approach, he may well be able to be the person for the job. With regards to filling that black hole, we need to get a grip on our expenses. Um, and uh, I, I know I'm going to get cut off, but um, that is where it really lies. Our expenses need to be cut. Um, I wouldn't like to see any major cuts in the public sector, but if we were to, I would look high rather than low. 
you. Has anyone noticed how Ian Gorst and Philip Ozef's uh, election posters look the same? Um, it's just a thought because I, my, the initial answer to that question is that Ian Gorst would make the great Treasury Minister and I'll wait for the penny to drop. Um, now, uh, complete nonsense, of course, that there's no one in the States that could do it. We could list a few uh, Ian Gorst, we've said already. John Young, if he gets in the centre, he could do the job. Very experienced. He's in, he was an accountant. Uh, Tracy Balois, she's another one who's already been elected in St. John. John Fondre, he could do the job. Sarah Ferguson, she may well be capable of that. She's been chairing the Public Accounts Committee and has got a vast amount of experience on corporate services. I'll have to wait and see who's there, of course. Um, certainly, it, I won't be voting for Senator Rosa um, if he is re-elected, because um, I don't think he's done a good job. Um, I, I would like someone who doesn't leave a litany of civil servants who have either been sacked or left with a golden handshake. <laughs> and how many of those are there? We had a com controller and Auditor General who left. E everyone said he was a great guy. He had integrity. He's gone with a gagging clause. How many more of those do we need? Let's just get somebody else for the job. And if he does remain in the States, I'm sure there's a more uh, convenient uh, position that he could take, perhaps, which doesn't involve being in Jersey so often. <laughs> well, the, um, yeah, I, I already put down uh, Ian Gorst. Um, he, he, that's if he doesn't get the uh, Chief Minister's job. But, uh, his background is accounting, so I think he would be uh, very suitable, uh, got a level head, um, and hopefully uh, he can get to grips. So, I mean, it's a bit of a poison chalice taking that one on. Uh, you know, we're opening up a deficit within three years of £90 million, and it's something that's going to take some brave decisions um, to actually close that gap and, uh, and fill that hole in our accounts. Um, so I don't envy anybody actually getting the job. John Lafondre would have been a, another choice of mine. I think he's a, a very good candidate for the job. Um, so it just depends who gets in, and uh, let's see what happens. Someone just used the term poison chalice there of Treasury. I don't think it's ever been a poison chalice in the past, and I certainly have no faith in Philip Isaac to take us forward into the next uh, assembly at all as Treasury Minister, a Minister or even a States Member. As far as I'm concerned, we have a very, very good, strong team in the States that are quite capable of taking on that job. Monford has actually named a few names there and I think he's about right. For my money, I think the, the work she's done on the corporate services and, and uh, has an actual uh, 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 qualification in accountancy, my money would go on Sarah Ferguson and I hope she's elected as a senator. Thank you. Uh, someone, somebody else like to, to ask what is actually um, the relation between, how do they see the relation between a good, solid, organic food and, and health? Because, I mean, we are now going to spend probably a lot of money for a new hospital, but I think a lot of uh, preventive health care is actually missing. And um, yeah, so that's my question. I, I completely agree with you. Um, organic uh, vegetables, organic farm is better than uh, mass-produced vegetables and organic and uh, 
fruits and vegetables. I mean, I'm an horticulturist myself. I don't um, I don't practice anymore, but I very much do do believe and agree that uh, we should really focus on uh, natural products rather than products that have been have been played with or contaminated by other uh, other products. Um, the problem at the moment that I see with organic uh, farming and how they can reach out the masses is the pure fact that it's so expensive. Uh, we are in a, in an economical situation where uh, everyone is struggling to have money and to actually make that decision to go on to buy organic vegetables rather than your local supermarket will make many people think twice and maybe they will go into um, supermarket uh, vegetables. But yes, the long, long term uh, result is much better to have organic and I think there's been quite a few initiatives where allotments have been placed, placed in different parishes as an encouragement for people to start practicing uh, their own gardening and eating their own produce. So I completely agree with you and I think it's a good one, but we should be, the, the scheme should carry on. Thank you. Evening Ruth, thanks for your question. Um, uh, to answer firstly that organic is deemed to be more expensive, um, and yes, perhaps that's the initial um, uh, cost in setting up as organic, um, and perhaps in time it will come down in price. However, we have to accept on the island that um, without organic, as we have pumped our soils full of fertilizers for decades, um, we've forgotten to use such simple things as seaweed, um, our Jersey new potato no longer tastes like a Jersey new potato. Well, potato. Um, and we have green slush weed on our beaches. So I think Ruth's question raises the whole debate um, surrounding health and organic food. The next part of um, uh, my point I'd like to make is my understanding is that organic farming locally is the worst subsidized in, in Europe. And there is very little subsidy to organic farmers and there are some dedicated organic farmers here. The second point with this, um, two UK companies um, farming the entire island, taking the produce away and then selling it back to us is completely absurd. We have fertile soils, why don't we grow our own and then our produce will be cheaper for us. Thanks Ruth. Um, brilliant question. Organic food, we all want it. It is expensive. The reason why it's expensive is because it costs so much to make, uh, to grow. Um, one of the processes involved in being able to put an organic food label on your, on your carrot or your milk is um, a, a period of time in which, for instance, a field has to be left without fertilizer, left in a natural state for quite a number of years. Um, so that in itself is an expensive process for a farmer to, to, to initiate. Uh, Jane mentioned about subsidies. This year, unfortunately, one of the two um, herds that on the island that produce organic milk has had its subsidy cut. And they are now having to consider not providing us with organic milk, leaving there's only one. And I think that's a disgrace. I would like to see more subsidies for organic food. I would like to see organic food um, available to our children in, in our schools. Why not? It's available on our doorstep. Let's make it available to our children. Um, that would endorse our healthy living approach. Um, and I, I can see absolutely no reason why this shouldn't, shouldn't happen. You can see I'm getting a bit excited about it because it's something that I feel really strongly about. Um, and it's something that I, I would definitely want to pursue if I became deputy. Thank you, Ruth. I remember two farmers talking to each other, two gardeners, and one asked, uh, what do you put on your rhubarb? He says, uh, manure. He says, really, I, I put custard on mine. <laughs> um, but it is good that um, questions come up. There is obviously a link between health and organic farming. It's because we know what is put into organic, it's all natural. And it's even better, of course, if you can grow your own. Um, not just because you know where it's coming from, but all the added benefits that go along with it. Um, Jeff's done a great initiative with the allotments. I'd like to see more allotments in the parishes. I think another scheme that could be uh, used, and it's maybe something that the parishes could coordinate with or without the constables in the states, is that um, 
people who have grown perhaps a bit elderly who can't necessarily tend their gardens, you could have a scheme which is either run by the youth centre or by the parish where younger people who might live in a flat could come around and help them. That would have the added benefit of you know, bringing these two generations together, pass on the information, a bit of solidarity there. And all these kind of initiatives, especially when land is scarce, I think is really important, but that ties in again with population. If we're continually having garden grabs, which we're seeing in the in the parish, you know, bungalows converted into two or three um, storey apartments, um, that, that doesn't help. So the whole thing needs to be taken uh, in the round. The, um, yeah, organic farming. Uh, yes, I would support it. Um, obviously, it's the healthy choice. Um, Obviously, you don't use chemicals. Uh, it's more nutrition. It's healthier for you. Um, the only question is, I understand the land needs to be kept free of chemicals for some time before you can actually grow organically. Is there an availability of you know, this type of land locally, or uh, you know, you've got fields that are ready and waiting for organic produce that are suitable? I, I won't have, but I'm sure there are okay. farms around. Yeah. I do know that um, organic um, sales um, do fall uh, when money's tight and when there's a recession on it. it, it it's uh, something that you'd like when, when money is freer and you will eat, but obviously when money's tight, um, the fact the sales will actually um, will fall. Um, what about local supermarkets? Are they actually taking local produce from you uh, organically? No, some of them do. Well, that's encouraging. Because obviously our farmers, and that's something I would like to get behind, our young farmers with new product, new lines and everything else for export. I think it would be good, and I think if we can encourage them, that would be great. What a great advertisement for allotments, where people are getting out there, doing it for themselves, growing good on this veg, nearly 100% organically, and it's good quality stuff. Um, we had two bags of it from last week's uh, uh, um, National Vegetable Society uh, show at uh, Lake Bowls Club. Um, I'd like to just say there's, there's a myth about organic vegetables actually being nutritionally different to any other. The issue here is what they're treated with. Um, and there is a rule that we introduced on the allotments on day one that there should not be the use of pesticides, herbicides, and the other sides um, on the allotments. And um, I think people are actually gardening as organically as it's possible to do. Just one other thing here, the Soil Association who um, passed land for being organic, the qualifying period is actually five years. Um, and we have in our own parish, the gentleman who's got a very successful organic farm up at Sion, Brian Adair, I don't know if he's here, um, but if he is, I think he deserves a round of applause. Okay, well, um, some years ago I was on uh, the Adam Fish Committee. Remember those committees? Uh, we used to have those years ago before we got the ministerial system. And um, uh, w when I was there with Jean Lemaitre uh, and others on that committee, we helped set up the first organic milk program and uh, strategy to get land converted to organic so farmers received uh, a support in getting over to organic milk and you can go down to the supermarket now and you can buy organic Jersey milk. So um, helped with that originally and we, uh, we uh, created uh, payments to farmers for protecting the countryside and so uh, that's, uh, that's something that's uh, been in place for a, uh, for a while and I, uh, I hope it's still continuing well. If there's any farmers here uh, who can tell me whether it isn't performing well, I'd like to know. But um, the other thing as well is farm shops. I think farmers should be encouraged to have farm shops, put their produce in there. And, uh, and I think the planning department should make it easy for farmers to have a farm shop on their premises, because I think that is, um, uh, that in itself is important. I remember one farmer, farmer having a lot of <coughs> issues with the planning department. Why is it so difficult for someone to get approval for a little farm shop? 
Um, uh, regarding allotments, yes, there are allotments here at the Cru. There are some allotments at uh, Goree. Um, I know that at Goree, the waiting list there is full, and you can't get on there for two or three years at least. So um, maybe we need some more allotments around the island as well. Disappointment that uh, law reform is not at the forefront of the manifesto of each and every candidate. Um, because, as far as I'm concerned, from experiences that I've had and from discussions I've had with many friends and neighbours, it's one of the most serious issues that we have facing us in the island at the moment. Um, I've faced cancer twice in the last seven years, chemotherapy, hair loss, you name it, I've had it. None of it has caused me anything like the distress at being exposed to the current vagaries of the legal system. I have watched my children being destroyed through the inadequacies of the divorce system, the complete um, disinterest of those who should be looking after children in the island. I have run state members, I have run social workers, I have run health in despair asking who is responsible for children in this island. And having watched my children literally being ignored, and I consider myself fairly articulate and they're much loved children, I despair about children who perhaps come from homes who have no one speaking up to them because I certainly haven't been able to protect my children. Um, and as I say, um, if I sound um, um, sorry, emotional about it, it's because I have watched my children being absolutely destroyed by this system. I thought long and hard about standing for election myself and decided actually the best thing would be for me now to leave the island because I have no faith in the system. Um, and word is spreading. I have a legal background and um, our legal system is becoming an international joke. Whenever you go to buy books on law in Chancery Lane, and even the book said they made them up as they go along in the journey, don't they? And that's the way they came around. I understand the gentleman who was receiving for these made an announcement on national radio to the effect that Jersey is not to do business in Jersey because of the legal system. And that would certainly be, I would urge people not to live in Jersey because of the legal system. Certainly not bring their children up in the island and expose them to a system which ignores them and ignores the law um, in the interest of profit. I was disgusted to see an Evening Post headline trumpeting the profit. What's the question, please? Yes, the question. Well, the question would be, we can't hear properly. No, well, the question would be, um, it seems to be accepted now that a fair percentage of the population is extremely concerned about the cost complexity and fairness of the legal system. 
What would each of the candidates do to help drive through essential reform and modernisation of the legal system should they be elected? Hello, let's take the name again. Caroline Powell. Hi, Pat. Evening to you. Um, uh, yes, I can tell that was a very emotional um, uh, cry, really, from you in terms of what, what is an absurdity with the legal system here. Um, and the stories you hear of absolutely unbelievable costs across the board for all sorts of different areas, in particular the difficult area of divorce. One would expect that such an area should be dealt with in sympathy, and it's not the stories that you hear. Um, I'm distressed to hear that your children should be affected by this. Um, it's, in, in some ways, there is, I, I could say, there is the legal aid system, um, which I gather is, is in the process of reform. Um, and that um, in time we may have a better legal aid system. Um, I would give my advice to you to, to take any story to the local law society and raise it with them, particularly in terms of cost, they do a free survey. Um, if you feel that's all a bit in house, take it to your project and perhaps they can um, actually raise it with the law society. But um, I appreciate your concerns. Um, I think all of us here sympathise and have great um, feelings towards your situation, um, Caroline, and it's, um, it's distressing to see here what you've been through. Um, you've obviously been let down um, and haven't found the support that you've needed. Um, and it's obviously that you're an intelligent and, and eloquent lady able to express yourself and your, your words have not been heard. Um, and that's very, very disappointing in a society which um, is perfectly capable of, or should be perfectly capable of being able to assist people who need help. Um, I, I do believe that um, it's, it, it's not in my manifesto because it's not something that I'm familiar with and I don't want to claim to anybody that I will um, stand for a, a position which I, I do not have experience in. However, I do believe, and, and, and Monty's just advised me, that there is, um, this is being reviewed at the moment and Ian Gorst is one of the people who's heading that review of the legal system to um, eradicate this kind of situation again. Okay, thanks, uh, Carolyn. Um, I don't think there's any platitudes that I can give you, and we've spoken before on this issue. What, what I would say is that cases like yours and other people who have been through the mill and are going through the mill, they are the mainstream of politics is now starting to take notice of that. And the first key change that was made was that responsibility for the justice system has now come under the chief minister's role, whereas before it was left to the courts. So I think it's important that it's been an established principle now that there should be some form of political oversight of the judiciary and, and of um, access to justice. And I was keen, to, I was pleased to be able to push for that. Uh, along with the other St. Bernard Deputy, John Young, who's been working, and we're, we are working at the moment with the Chief Minister's Department, and that's something that will continue if I do get back in. Um, what's been positive, although there, there are, there's a divergence of views amongst the late legal profession, as you can imagine, because, you know, they're not going to necessarily hold their hands up um, when there are issues, but something that they have acknowledged, and there's consensus that the current divorce law is not fit for purpose, that needs to be changed, and everything that goes with that, the protection of children, the way they get dragged into it, often when two parents are disputing at a particularly acrimonious time, which isn't always helped by the lawyers themselves, um, that is that is recognised, and it is something I hope no one else has to experience, uh, and if people in the room don't necessarily know where you're coming from, then they should be grateful. <clears throat> Carolyn, um, just say I'm appalled to hear you know the treatment that you've uh, that you have received, and uh, you know this is Josie we're talking about. And you'd think you'd uh, be treated with more respect, and your children would have uh, you know a, a, a better um, thing. But uh, personally, I've had like Natalie no um, dealings with the legal side of things, and quite for well, fortunate in that respect by the sound of it, because it's uh, it sounds quite horrendous. Um, 
The, um, have you contacted like your deputy or your constable or anything? Did anybody help you out at the time? <coughs> right. Okay. <coughs> I think I've come across many, many people who have suffered and children who have suffered. And it beggars belief. I mean, it isn't even, I mean, it isn't even when parents want to want to fight or leave the car in my case, not want to fight. It's the fact that there is money to be made out of torturing children through the law school. Thank you. <coughs> You're carrying a, a very saddening story, the second one we've heard tonight, and um, this does mean that um, urgent attention needs to be put to the divorce law because it seems to be that's at the heart of this, and the fact that uh, your access to justice is not uh, as uh, as good as it should be. And certainly if I was elected, I would want to make that a priority as well because being a sentinel, I can understand um, what it means not to have proper justice um, delivered um, as you need in your circumstances. Um, it is something that uh, is very close to me. Um, as I mentioned before, um, part of what we charge is to keep uh, young people out of the criminal justice system. By the same token, it's very important that the, the whole justice system recognises that there's people like yourself that are put into circumstances which the law is not supporting adequately. Thank you. Okay, I would say, first of all, don't leave the island. I think there may be some hope for you yet. Um, if I'm elected, I certainly would do my best to help you. Um, I know where you've been because my wife had chemotherapy two, uh, two years ago. And um, it's a very stressful situation. It puts a lot of pressure on the family. It, uh, the husband, sometimes feels they can't cope with it, almost wants to run away. I don't know how your husband fear felt, but uh, it's a very stressful thing. And, uh, and uh, I think then that if the family is affected, and this is, a, this is where there's a problem. Can I just say, just to, to get across, so that people clearly understand the brutality. As a mother here, twice, and I had full private medical health care, and I had one of the best professors in, in London, who's a private health kit. The court, in two circumstances, took great delight in cutting off my private health care, even though I already had been a, a cancer patient. I've got a little bit of time to, I don't know if it's <laughs> ended or not, but uh, I, uh, so I sympathise totally with you. Um, the Batonnier should appoint a lawyer for you, and as such, uh, you should have a lawyer appointed. Plus, there, I think there's a mediation service as well where you can interact with you and your husband. I don't know how whether you communicate well with your husband at the moment. Um, I, I just realised I've not been had my microphone on again, but um, I think there are, there are some. I will help you. Whatever you need, I'll help you. Hi, Caroline. Uh, in my line, line of work, I do work with vulnerable women and vulnerable children. So I have seen quite a few cases like yourself. I obviously don't know of the particular situations of your case, but uh, I, I do understand and I feel for you. Um, yes. A lot of women, when they're going through a separation and there is children's custody involved, uh, it is it is a very very tricky. Uh, situation to be in, especially once the law takes take, takes over the situation, which I mean uh, when the lawyers start dealing with one party and the other one. When it comes to that situation, no other services really have got any enforcement to come in. And that's when you know a lot of women frustration comes from. Obviously, it's, it's not just about frustration, it's about seeing their children uh, suffer and not being able to do anything because the law takes over and the lawyers seem to, to be able, just like you said, to be disputing rather, it's rather a tit for tat rather than focusing the emotional well-being of the children and the vulnerable people involved. Um, the law needs to be changed and needs to address uh, the emotions of people who suffer circumstances such as those. And uh, it's something that we really should all focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
how uh, at the start uh, we talked about 9.30 or uh, I mean your hands as well, I mean there's other people got their hands up. Uh, just a general feeling Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Nicola Dominey and I've uh, lived in Can't hear you very much. Can't hear you. Good evening, my name is Nicola Dolman and I've lived in the parish for 30 years. And my question is, where is your preferred site for a new Lacanabe school and why? Thank you for your question, um, Nicola Dorman. Um, the Kennebec the School we've discussed uh, already, and it's in my manifesto, I very much support the redevelopment of the Kennebec School. I am aware that people are very concerned about the fact that we may need to take over a, a green field um, in the surrounding area to, in order to do this. However, um, if we do that, and if that is the route that has to be taken, which I believe the, um, the youth of our parish and the teachers who work at the school 100% deserve. Um, we should do all that we can to make the best of the land that is then what, where Kennebec School is at the moment. So I would like to see as much of that returned to green, use perhaps for the allotments that we've talked about, perhaps resolve some of the parking issues. I wouldn't like to see it built on but I do endorse the fact that we desperately need another secondary school for Kennebec. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. I was, I was waiting for this question to come up, as I'm sure we all were. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, in fact, that any of the sites that have been identified are ideal, and the problem is the public haven't, and particularly the residents of this district, have not been party to that document yet. There were <coughs> 10 sites initially that were uh, earmarked and looked at. Most of them were not viable at all. The, the field, admittedly, um, opposite um, the current playing fields towards the airport, but not that quite far up, uh, are viable insofar as there's space there, but do we really want to give up some agricultural land, especially when issues such as food security and what we're going to talk about tonight are quite important in the future? Um, so I don't think there's a magic solution. I, I, I don't think that we've found all of the sites, but that's a decision that needs to be taken in consultation with the parishioners and users of the school. But I, I won't sit on the fence. I, I do think we do need a new school. The current one is not large enough. It hasn't changed since I was there uh, 22 years ago. And that's, yeah, and so we do need um, something that's fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. Like Monty, I was, uh, also went to the Kennebec. Um, it, it was originally, I think, built for 400 pupils, and I think currently there are 700 there. Um, and it is, is in desperate need of being replaced with a new school. Um, the overcrowding in the science labs, for example, is quite hazardous. There's too many children, um, from a health and safety point of view, sorry, John, um, that, um, so that, that, that is a problem. So, uh, the site, I think it should be wherever it goes, open to public consultation. I think everybody needs to be aware, you know, where, where it's going to go, and that we need to hear their concerns. Uh, the Zorm obviously has been um, earmarked um, for a possible site. Uh, it is a green field. I did say in my manifesto, and I pledged to support and defend robustly green fields. So, is there another solution somewhere? I possibly think. Again, it's a field, but it's the, the playing fields. Maybe the school could jump just over on, onto the playing fields there. Somebody said the... Sorry, finish. Yeah. The school was built in 1964. It was designed for 500 pupils. In 2002, a plan was recommended for refurbishment. In 2010, a report stated it was no longer fit for purpose. By 2012, the school had 700 pupils, and today it's 760. It's 2014, and we still do nothing about it. I put it into my manifesto. I would not 
like to see the school built on a greenfield site, but I will go with the consensus opinion of the public after consultation. If that's where it's chosen to go, I'll go with that because the school is very important. But there are many other sites under consideration in the uh, Western parishes. The school was built for the Western parishes, not specifically Sabrella. So there's plenty of opportunity, perhaps, to look at other sites, not in Sabrella, but in other parishes. I'll put the microphone on this time. I think even when I don't put the microphone on, you will probably still hear me because uh, I, I tend to speak in a, a loud manner, so normally it carries to the back. But if everybody can hear me, that's fine. I did cover this in my opening uh, introduction about myself, really. Um, definitely, the I, I support the, uh, moving the school. It, it is uh, more than 700 pupils there. Uh, and um, I, I feel that... What is important as well is where the new school goes, wherever that may be, we need to have full public consultation. There are bound to be traffic issues and pedestrian issues and, uh, and, and getting uh, cyclists there and so on, all that sort of thing. So that's a big part of it all. Then, of course, then you've got the old school site, and that could be freed up then. Uh, and we heard from the young people recently that they would like to have a, maybe a sixth form block or something there. So you could have a sick form center, an IT center, something useful for young people. Yeah, you could also have el homes for the elderly and, uh, uh, and also... <laughs> I did cover it earlier on. <laughs> hope you were listening. <laughs> Hi, Nicola. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, I did say as well in my introdu introduction that uh, I do support the development of Canterbury School. I think it's long overdue, especially when you look around other parishes in the island where development or fully uh, re uh, modernization of other schools has taken place. So we do need a new school. I don't think anything is going to happen to Canterbury School for the, for the next year or so just yet. But when that happens, the, the public uh, consultation will take place and people who have concerns will have an opportunity to you know to to explain or to show their views and to discuss and uh, to show their main concerns about the development but it's you know I agree with it it should it should take place Evening Nikki good question um, my thoughts are as in in my opening speech is that um, I endeavour to, or would endeavour to, protect the countryside and green fields um, as a key priority. There's actually a, um, a dual issue here, um, three issues. Firstly, the school is, is well outdated. Um, it's in a shabby state of repair. Um, and I think it's very noble that the kids are going in, actually, because it's well overdue for refurbishment. Um, the next issue is um, sort of looks a bit more like the sort of bigger picture. That is traffic congestion, which um, Peter has mentioned. Should we not be looking at this idea of um, a sixth form centre with the new school? Um, which then contains people yeah. the west of the island then has a facility for their children without having to go into Highlands and Holia. So the future in three or four years' time when it is developed is we have sick form centre and new school. I think that's really exciting, but not the green field. <laughs>
don't go out there and vote for ministers in the senatorial elections or any other ones who have already said and have already got a proven track record of increasing the population as part of their plan to deal with the uh, ageing population, because that doesn't work. And that is why we're seeing an increase in our parish. The, the electoral roll has increased because so many more people have moved to St. Bernard. Couple that with the fact that we've got a love affair with the car, even though we're on a very good bus service, then we are going to see traffic problems like this. I don't think it's a simple yes or no. If we, if we buy into that same government and give those ministers our support, we have to deal with the consequences of uh, more people living in the island. What we need to do is elect people who uh, absolutely say we want to limit population growth and the folly that it is. Um, so, but we will have to have a, a new school somewhere. I think that's the key thing. But certainly for my part, I will oppose inappropriate development as I have done. Yeah, Mr. Kennett, the, um, I, I did say in my previous uh, question that I would robustly defend uh, any greenfield uh, in, in the parish. Uh, obviously, education is paramount as well because we need to give our youngsters uh, a future and, uh, and a good education. So exactly where the schools are going to go is, uh, is obviously up for, for a major debate. So uh, I, I look forward to, uh, should I be elected, uh, deciding where it goes. Thank you very much. Um, I, I said uh, in my remarks that uh, um, I prefer it not to go there and I'd go further to say that I don't want it to go there and I would protect that. Um, but I'm also mindful of the fact that if you elect me as deputy, um, I'm serving you. So if the community itself said that's where it goes, I, I think I would be duty bound to support it. Um, but as far as it goes, I do my utmost to, to, to persuade people that it's not the right place to put it and we do need to retain those green fields. <clears throat> uh, yes, well, tra you mentioned two things there. Traffic is increasing at, a, at a, an alarming rate, and we maybe need to encourage people to do some car sharing. Uh, uh, we, we've got a good, a good bus service, but uh, maybe there are improvements to that, even where we could, we could have a bus going in uh, a loop around, uh, around the parish. Uh, so that is something along those lines to in, in just move, move circulation around the parish rather than relying on the car to get everywhere. Um, the existing site for the school is, is, is too small, so we've got, to, we've got to move it somewhere. So the next thing is, um, uh, where can it go? And there are only limited areas in, in the parish. Um, the other thing we could do is, well, uh, would we want to move it to St Peter's? I don't know. Uh, and, uh, I don't think they'd like. I don't think they'd like it. So it's our problem, and we have to deal with it. So um, it's going to have to go. Some, it's going to have to go somewhere, obviously. Uh, but uh, for the protection of the fields, yes, we want to do that. We have to take it into consideration, and it all has to go to public consultation. Hi, hello. Um, green fields and residential areas in Jersey, it's about balance. I mean, there's not many green spaces, as you, we all know, uh, and the population is growing. People need to go somewhere. Build, builds need, the buildings need to go up, and, and it's a tricky balance act. Uh, I think ministers and deputies, people involved in the states, they need to really take careful consideration about they, how they're going to build and how people are going to be affected. So I'm all for reducing as much building as possible and if it needs to be done, to be done in a, in a manner that is going to affect people the least possible. Evening, Mrs. Kenner. Yeah. I know you speak as a former constable of the parish and that you have seen these fields and, and some fields being taken up for building over the years. Um, uh, I think you have a very good point that that scenic view as you drive from Kennevay towards the airport, despite the airport being such a large building, there still is the ability to see a sunset in between and to see greenness. And I think we have to try and maintain that. There must be a way of extending the existing school. I know that the current council of the parish has concerns with access um, through the existing housing estate. I think that could be altered quite considerably so the housing estate isn't affected and that we extend out onto the existing playing fields and perhaps linking with the sports centre. Um, I think it needs looking into and public consultation is vital in, in feedback. Thank you. Um, okay, 
The relocation of the school is not just a Sabrellard problem, it's an island problem. We all have to make a decision as to where it's going to go. If we need to look at looking at other western parishes, then so be it. We need to look at other western parishes and see what the options are. Once that's, that's uh, identified and uh, the public goes with that decision, that's what we should do. Um, with regards to transport, the transport between here and St Peter's needs to be improved and there should be a bus service that takes us from here to there instead of us having to go to town and back. <coughs> Simple. Um, with regards to losing the field, we don't want to lose the field, but as I've said, if we have to, let's find some other green space, and I do not agree with building a school on the sports fields. No. No. A question and then the one from that lady, and then uh, I'll call um, the machine. Mary, no, perhaps you'd like to ask them both together. You yeah. ask her a question, and the lady asks her a question. My name is Rupert Longlarge uh, from Montella Brew. In the new States Assembly in the autumn, one of the biggest debates will be about the largest capital project the island has ever seen, and that's the new hospital. You, as potentially new deputies, will be asked either to accept the present position of the health minister and her advisers, i.e. to spend £430 million at today's figures, or £4.3 million per head of population at the moment, or as an incoming deputy, you have the chance to challenge the health minister and her advisers and ask her to spend that money more cost effectively. Can I ask you which way, which option you would choose? Thank you. Could the other lady ask a question now? Ask the candidates, please. Um, and so both in uh, fairly good order. Hi. Hi, my name is Siobhan Bentley, I'm 19, um, I was born in Jersey, lived here for a couple of years, and, Speak up a bit, oh, sorry, um, I was born over here, lived here for a few years, and then moved to France at a very young age. I've now decided to come back, and I've been living here for a year, and I'm not allowed to vote, because of the five-year residency thing. Um, I, don't, I don't find that the island that we live in, um, we, we don't have any equality. There's, um, like, people like myself, we have, I have to rely on the bank of mum and dad to fund me. Um, would, would any of you do something about this? Because it's just ridiculous. Yeah, firstly, uh, the hospital uh, question. Um, we are, I think, in desperate need of a, of a new hospital. Um, I, I, I never agreed with uh, putting the um, site in two places. Uh, it, it, just the fact that you have to spend 1.753 million every year just with logistics between ferrying with some pieces and people, etc., between the two two uh, locations. The um, it is a lot of money, uh, but we have got to uh, consider that health is a prior priority in, in my mind. Uh, when you fall ill, you want to be looked after, basically, and we need to um, well, have one of the best health services available uh, that we can afford, uh, and I think that's what we'll get. Um, I would prefer to, to build uh, a, an extension to the existing hospital, possibly acquiring the hotels in Kensington Street, near the Revere, uh, and making it a one-site uh, hotel, um, hospital, sorry. <laughs> So, uh, so that's that one, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, there does seem a lot of inequalities um, with regards to residency uh, and things. And the fact you were born here, you'd think there'd be some kind of um, you know, some kind of thing that would allow you to, to vote within the year. There are, well, if should I be elected, I'll, I'll be looking at all of those things. Thank you. Thank you. 
It makes no sense to have hospitals on two sites. I'm certainly opposed to that. Yes, that's absolute uh, rubbish, that is. Um, I'm also aware of the fact that uh, um, the hospital seems to have, or the Department of Health seems to have acquired two substantial buildings um, on the island site. And if we're talking about saving money and uh, filling black holes and uh, generally stopping states wastage, um, I might suggest that uh, re uh, um, evaluating whether or not the existing hospital can be extended to the size that it needs to be would be a better option than building new, because sure as eggs are eggs, the £400 million pounds they're talking about now will probably be double that by the time that the, the doors are open, and we can't afford it. There was a second question, I mean, he forgot, because I think mean, it's absolutely ridiculous that if you're born here and you leave the island for a short period, you come back, you lose your voting rights. That is absolutely ridiculous and could be changed overnight, that law, and I think it should be. Uh, yes, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I'm totally against uh, having a two-site hospital. We need a, a purpose-built hospital. And uh, let's be honest, if you're going to build a new hospital, for, if, you're going to, if you're going to build a hospital for the future, we've got a population that's, that's growing. If you're going to do it, do it right. Don't do it wrong. Uh, when they're starting from a, a totally wrong Ballpark. Uh, it's madness. I've been told by a doctor we'd have blood being delivered from site A to site B, either in taxis or in ambulances. I mean, what idiot would think of that? Uh, it's, it's madness, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't happen. I don't uh, don't agree with it at all, and uh, and that's uh, that is, it's totally wrong. It won't work, and it'll cost a hell of a lot of money to. Uh, to administer the whole thing across two sites. More staff, more administration, it's all wrong. Uh, as to the young lady at the back, well, I can sympathise with you. I mean, we do, we do have a law so that people can't vote in. Uh, I mean, you can probably vote back where you've come from, actually. I don't know. But, um, uh, and then you come here, so you'd end up with two votes, one where you've just come from and one here. So I think the intention of the law is that you are showing an intention to be in Jersey for a certain amount of time and then you can vote. Um, but, there are, uh, but there are a lot of reasons what, why we have to do, we have to have regulations. But I, I think things could be made easier, absolutely. Hi, uh, with regards to the first question and the building of a new hospital, uh, that is long overdue and obviously if we, if we talk about the population growth, I mean, it, it makes sense and it needs to be done the sooner the better. Uh, after speaking to a lot of people, uh, the general feeling is that the hospital should really be set up in one location rather than be uh, split into two locations. So that's how I feel about that as well. Um, to the young lady, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, yes, I mean, <coughs> It feels really unfair for a Jersey person to come back and be entitled to so many other things but not being entitled to vote. I don't know why the law is there. How long does it take to make a, a political decision in who do you want to vote for? So yes, maybe the legislation needs to be changed. Hi, good evening, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Um, firstly, um, to question uh, your 430 million, that's gone up 130 million in a week, um, from my estimation. But uh, well done, that can happen in Jersey, can't it? The, pub the published Millions, figure was 430. Sorry? The published figure was 430. Right, yeah, I, I read in the budget details 300 a week ago. But it could be an increase in that time. Um, entirely agree with you, your question, uh, to question the health minister, most certainly, it's an extraordinary amount of money, 430 million, and I, if I was to be voted in SEPTI, would like to go through every pound, if not every million, as to what it was being spent on. I think you'd appreciate that. Um, the second question, um, it needs a banner. It needs a banner in the Royal Square to say what on earth is going on. Um, I want to vote. I'm a Jersey person. Just because I've left the island for a few years and come back, I'm, I'm coming back. I want to vote. Let me. Okay. Thanks very much. 
Um, to answer your question, Rupert, yes, I would challenge the cost effectiveness of having two sites. Um, for all of us here, I think it makes common sense to have everything on one site. If what we, the facilities that we have now are inadequate um, and we have the funds put aside to uh, invest in this project, it should be on a purpose-built, um, in a purpose-built building, um, fit for the, for the job that it is, 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 is required. Um, I don't like the idea of losing another hotel um, to uh, expand on the current site. We've lost enough of those. Um, with regards to the um, Siobhan's question, um, I'm unclear actually as to how long she's been out of the island. Um, um, I think maybe, did you say you were back a year? Yeah. Yeah, um, I believe that these regulations are put in place in order to, um, uh, as Peter said, I think it was Peter who said earlier, to, to regulate whether you vote in one place or another, and there is always some, it, wherever you go, there is a certain amount of time that you have to spend saying that I'm here, I belong to this country, and I'm going to be a part of this community, and therefore I have a right to vote. Um, I'm glad that you want to vote, and um, I hope the next time round that you will be as enthusiastic and be involved um, as you are now. Yeah, thank you. Um, Siobhan, you, you probably can vote if you've been here, been back six months and you've lived in Jersey five years, and you can talk to our electoral officer over there. Tomorrow's the deadline, so it's really good news. You probably can vote in the next in this election. Um, I think there are underlying issues which we can perhaps talk about afterwards about representation of the our generation, your generation, and I think we do that by electing states members who who will prioritise that amongst other things. With regard to the hospital, we need to have it on one site. That's one way to keep down costs. We might people might know what the Midas touch is. Remember Midas, everything you touch turned to gold. The problem is we've got a certain minister who's got the reverse Midas touch. And if you think of the Radisson, if you think of Lime Grove, um, and now this is the fact that the, the site is obvious. It should be going on the Esplanade. One site, which is central location, could be uh, next to the police station, but that's already been done. And that, that's the whole point. I think it, all under one roof. Now, the cost does need to be looked at. We need to get value for money. But it will cost a significant amount of money. And when we're constantly told about the decades of uh, wise management of our money, why, are we, why have we been left in this situation by the outgoing Treasury Minister? That's the question I would like to ask on Friday. Perhaps someone else can do it for me at this hustings. <laughs> Whilst I'm on my feet, can I thank, uh, as the last speaker, can I thank Senator Brecken um, for his service tonight and also I think just generally his service in the States during the time he's been there. And also one of our parish deputies who can't be here tonight, he's obviously attending his own senatorial hustings. I think it's important that we thank him for his nine years of service to the parish and hopefully he's gone on to greater and better things. Um, in closing, on behalf of Canon H, uh, thank, can I thank you good people for coming along tonight and showing uh, there's been a number of uh, emotive and, uh, uh, and various question, varied questions. Apologies for some of the microphones. Each time we seem to have the one that, uh, that wasn't uh, wasn't working. Uh, as you can see, we have set, uh, seven candidates uh, for two seats, and also on Friday night, as uh, one of us just mentioned, uh, we have the senatorial hustings here on Friday night at 7:30. So again, it will be an opportunity uh, to question the candidates, and I might even take the opportunity to question uh, myself. And there's 18 candidates. Uh, for eight seats. The polling station is here on the 15th of October, so as well as the deputies, you get a chance to vote for uh, eight of the 18 candidates, up to eight, in the senatorial. And there's also a referendum question about whether the constables should remain in the states as an automatic right. So there's plenty there uh, to think about. The candidates have gone out uh, to a lot of trouble producing manifestos, putting posters up, going around uh, to meet you, and I hope you will turn out, regardless of who you were up for, uh, in force on the 15th of October. Uh, and thank you. Good night. Have a safe journey. Thank you.